featured myself. My name is Ashley Barker. I'm part of the IDEAS ECP project. Uh, this webinar series is brought to you by the IDEAS Productivity Project and the Exascale Computing Project in collaboration with the computing facilities of Argonne, Oak Ridge, and uh, Berkeley Labs. Our speaker today is Andrew Lumsdane from Pacific Northwest National Laboratory and the University of Washington. Andrew is currently the Chief Scientist at the Northwest Institute for Advanced Computing, a Seattle-based joint research institute between PNNL and the University of Washington. His current research interests focus on scalable graph analytics and the convergence of big data, HPC, and machine learning. He and members of his research group made several not notable contributions to C++11, and uh, he is one of our recipients of the 2018 Better Scientific Software Fellowship. A couple of just general housekeeping announcements. We do have a Google Doc where we're collecting your questions today for this webinar. The link is on this slide as well as in the chat window and in the email that I sent you yesterday with the connection information. We highly encourage you to put your questions inside that document rather than the WebEx chat, chat functionality as it's much easier for multiple people to be able to read and respond to your questions. And then finally, at the conclusion of this event, we really want to encourage you to take our survey. Uh, we will send you the link as well, and it's also in the email I sent yesterday. Uh, your feedback on these events is very helpful as we move forward with scheduling future events. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing, give control to Andrew, and let Andrew begin. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Yeah, sorry, just make sure I'm unmuted. So yeah, good day, everyone. Um, I'm happy to be here and, and talk about uh, C++. I think this is um, maybe the largest audience I've uh, spoken to, or I guess not spoken to in some time. Um, and so everyone here um, is here to hear about modern C++ for high-performance computing. And there's a particular way I want to present that, and that really has to do with uh, sort of how I got to the place I am right now, my thinking about it. And so there's a, a little bit of backstory. As um, Ashley mentioned, um, when I was at Indiana University, I, I was um, on the faculty there for uh, about 15 years and um, had a privileged to work with a, a, a number of amazing uh, students and postdocs. And for uh, some time, we were, uh, there was a, a subgroup of us working on issues related to the C++ language. And we ended up uh, contributing a number of features, variadic templates, Lambda, decal type, um, and my favorite, um, enable if. Um, unfortunately, not concepts, but those will uh, be in, in C++ 20 coming up. Um, two and a half years ago, I moved um, from um, Indiana to Seattle and had a new institution uh, and had the opportunity to teach a course in high performance scientific computing. And what's interesting about the course here is that it's for computational scientists, not computer scientists. So I had to we're going to rethink a little bit of uh, the way um, I was developing the material, particularly relative to programming. And in fact, I, since I was in a new institution, new city, uh, so forth, and gave me an opportunity to uh, really just take a fresh look at the course. So I just did everything from scratch, all the slides, homeworks, everything. And um, it chose uh, for various reasons C++ as a language to use, uh, nonetheless. And as I was going through it, um, well, something happened. So Bjorn Strustrup, uh, the inventor of the C++ language, has always had this saying that inside of C++, there's a beautiful, tiny language trying to escape. And um, as I was going through the course, I really did have this epiphany uh, that there really was this beautiful core 
of C++ that really was the result of the, the uh, coalescence of a number of the features that had uh, been developed in C++11 as well as just the uh, years of um, uh, practices and, and um, idioms that had, had developed around it. So, um, you know, I, like I said, Epiphany, I was very excited about um, how C++ could be used in, in HPC and in scientific computing. And um, in fact, uh, my uh, fellowship in um, the Better Scientific Software Program, and uh, thank you, um, IDEAS and ECP and BSSW, um, was really to continue to develop those materials and, and really target it, um, not just for the students in the course, but for um, ECP as well. So what this webinar is not about, is, and I hope this doesn't disappoint any of the audience, but it's not about language features per se. So of course, C++11 has many new features compared to C++3 and its predecessors, and many, many more than we could ever uh, possibly hope to cover in an hour. I mean, it has um, a huge number of features beyond C++03 and just in and of itself. But I guess maybe one, one of the main takeaways I think I want everyone to have from this webinar is that um, C++ today, and I'll be referring it to C++11 because that was really the phase change, but um, it's not just C++3 or other previous versions with more features. It's really um, a new language, and a language is not just its features, and, and features per se aren't the source of power in a language. And you know, th this kind of flies in the face of traditional uh, pedagogy in uh, programming language um, education, where um, you know, since programming languages have uh, matured over time and add features. Um, Often, particularly since it's uh, taught by old people like me who have also um, watched those features be added, uh, languages get taught and C++ gets taught as C plus 45 years of new features. And in fact, um, if you look at the table of contents in a, in a modern C++ book, you'll see, so on, on the left-hand side is the table of contents from the original Kernigan and Ritchie uh, pre ANSI C book, and it has um, you know, this particular set of topics. Um, and this is a, a table of contents from a C book I won't name, but the topics are the same in the same order. Um, it's really, uh, well, as I said, this kind of pedagogy recapitulates ontogeny. And uh, I think it's unfortunate, and I, what I, I really want to try to get across in this course is to, for everyone to forget everything you know uh, right now about C and even C++, and let's look, about, look at how to do um, effective, and I'll even call it tasteful, uh, programming in C++11. And that's in contrast to you know, how to write C++11 in, in your programs, if you can uh, appreciate the difference. And one of the important lessons I try to get across to my students, both in, in this HPC course as well as other uh, programming courses, is that code is not just, and is, is maybe even only secondarily, a set of instructions for a computer. It's really um, an actual language and is a medium of communication between yourself, other developers, and um, between yourself and yourself. And like any language, a uh, programming language has a syntax and a vocabulary and a style. So of course in the English language we have uh, guidelines that have, have been collected like you know, Strunk and White. In C++, um, there's also, has been evolving, and this is a wonderful online resource uh, called C++ Core Guidelines. And so one thing then I want everyone to also keep in mind as we're 
going through some of the elements of style, if you like, about C++ is that, um, you know, it should really be affecting the way you think about programming. I mean, it's, it's not just, again, it's not just a, a new set of features on top of previous versions of C++. It's really just, you know, a, a new language. And so, um, What's a programming language actually for then? So uh, like any tool, um, I would claim it's a tool for managing complexity. And when I used to teach a, an introductory programming course, um, in the first lecture, I would have the students uh, discuss what is the most powerful mental tool for managing complexity. And being in here in Seattle, of course, I have a great example of you know very, very complex uh, artifact, uh, you know, airliners, and, and despite uh, recent events, um, these things are probably some of the most complex things humans build, but also some of the most reliable. And so somehow mentally uh, humans can do that. So I have have the class discuss you know, what is it and that, that makes um, these things tractable. And usually, ultimately, and where I'll be trying to lead them is that um, the most powerful mental tool for managing complexity is abstraction. And so really, in, in terms of what to use a programming language for, it's really how do you create for yourself a framework in which you can uh, managing complexity of the, the task at hand by building the right um, set of abstractions so that you can uh, manage all of the different pieces without um, overwhelming yourself. So this all boils down um, ultimately, and, and if you have no other takeaways than this, um, you should be able to remember um, there's just two simple rules uh, for writing tasteful or, or good software. Uh, the first rule of writing software, don't be clever. The second rule of writing software is don't be clever. And um, this actually manifests itself through the uh, C++ core guidelines, which I, I, I mentioned uh, earlier. Um, it actually has uh, many sections about um, the philosophy and uh, about how to uh, use different features in the language, but some of the, the, the highest order uh, philosophy guidelines are, in some sense, express your ideas directly in code, and number three, express intent. So, and do that without being clever. So the um, rest of the core guidelines, um, uh, it won't take time to uh, name, but there's four basically each major set of language features, a uh, very nice set of guidelines. There's also the GSL uh, guideline support library, which helps um, enforce um, and also assist in um, using the guidelines. So the, the one set of guidelines I do want to um, bring up, though, is uh, the performance core guidelines and the two most important ones, um, and maybe they're really one and the same, is don't optimize without reason, don't optimize prematurely. And this is, uh, I, I think, might have also been Alan Perlis, but um, you know, there's another saying that uh, premature optimization is the root of all evil. And so again, um, and and we'll we'll come back to this because these days I, um, a, a lot of optimization can actually be offloaded to uh, compilers. But um, again, don't be clever, don't optimize um, prematurely, don't optimize without reason. So to kind of give you an idea of what this all looks like, I want to um, kind of do a case study um, in a topic I'm sure everyone um, is familiar with, numerical linear algebra, and look at uh, kind of these two key aspects of abstraction, um, 
building abstractions with the data. Uh, so I want to look at how we would build a vector class um, in, a, in a modern approach, and then uh, keep that same approach to build up a matrix class, and then um, also look at that in terms of how we could then build uh, procedural abstractions. So for a vector, um, it's important, of course, with, with any abstraction that, um, and again, since we're using a language, we're expressing things, it's important to uh, write things in, in a language other people understand. Um, it's communication, after all. And so for a vector class, um, it's important that the software, the abstractions, reflect what people think of mathematically um, as a vector, right? So it has n elements, it can be accessed with a subscript, it can be scaled, it can be added. And so here is a class that we can use to represent a vector abstraction. And it's a simple class, but this is actually surprisingly powerful. And, and this isn't, although you know it fits here in 13 lines of code, this isn't a, a toy class. This is, I use this all the time. So to uh, kind of walk through some of the pieces. Uh, first, of course, we have a constructor um, which brings the thing into existence. Uh, vector always has a size, so we construct with the size. Uh, the other important thing about a vector was that we can access elements with an index. Here we um, overload operator parentheses to take an index and return an element so that we can read and write uh, to those elements, and then we have internal state um, for the vector, in this case, its size, and the number of elements we, we have for it. Now, let's look at why we did some of these things and, and why they're important. So, and I'll be quoting some chapter and verses here from the C++ core guidelines. But first, um, in the constructor, uh, constructors should create a fully initialized object. So when you start using, you declare your variable, it's constructed in the, the next statement in your code after that, the object should be usable, it should be fully created, fully initialized. Um, and in the constructor itself, um, initialization syntax and um, should be preferred to actually assigning it within the body of the constructor. In a class, you should always um, minimize exposure of the members. The point of having a um, interface through the member functions is to maintain invariance on the members, so you want to uh, keep those hidden. And you should only make a function a member if it needs direct access to the represent representation of the class. So in some sense, that's why there's no other member functions here for this vector class, because as we'll see, we'll be able to write everything we need to be able to do with vectors in a vector notation using uh, the operator parentheses um, accessors. And for those accessors, uh, they're small, uh, time critical, I mean, they're going to be called every time we index into the variable. So we want to um, include its text uh, with the function so that it will be made um, in line. Now, in terms of one, one important theme also we'll, that we'll, we'll be running through um, the, the rest of the webinar here is about classes and the use of them and objects as resource handles and as means for managing computational resources. So in a class, when you acquire resources in a constructor, they need to all be released in the destructor. Um, as we'll also see, there are a number of uh, default operations that every class needs. Um, I just alluded here to a destructor and that we need to release all of the class's resources in that destructor, but we haven't actually written a destructor. And that's because um, we're, in some sense we're using the resource 
uh, for storage as a value type. And we're actually creating the vector as a value type. And so the construction of those types is very well defined when the um, object is brought into existence. We are calling the <clears throat> constructors for storage. The destructor will be automatically called when the default um, destructor for this class is called. So we can avoid defining um, uh, many, well, all but one of the default operations. And in terms of storage, here you'll notice um, we're using an STD vector or an STL vector, if you like. It's one dimensional uh, storage container uh, from the C um, standard library. Uh, one should uh, prefer using that um, over um, a C array, for instance. And again, you know, if you notice, we're not using, you know, using a new or a malloc or anything like that. We're just calling to get all the storage we need for the vector, just invoking its constructor, and um, we have it there automatically, and it is also uh, destroyed automatically. So here's a quick example of some, some different uses of the vector class and also um, just some principles for writing software in general. So in any statement you have, whenever you bring an object or a variable into existence, it should always be initialized. There should never be incomplete objects um, around. So you want to always initialize that, whether it's an integer or you know, an actual object. You should also not introduce variables uh, before you need them. So um, in this case, we didn't need to declare vector z um, and then initialize x and y and then assign the sum to z. We just declare z and as the sum of, of those two things. It's sort of a, a SSA form. And um, kind of you know, rule 20 and 21 together, um, you shouldn't declare a variable uh, before you need it. You should always initialize it. So you shouldn't declare a variable until you have a value to initialize it with. Now, <clears throat> Here's a implementation of, of, of actually the, the important parts in terms of resources of um, an operator plus function, uh, which does what it sounds like. It adds two vectors together. And in the old days, people would frown, and rightly so, at a function declared this way because inside of it, we are constructing this new vector z. We're acquiring its resources. And um, of course, when you acquire the resources for um, a variable, um, and here again, vector is essentially a value type, when you acquire those resources and the function goes out of scope, meaning when you return from the function, all the resources uh, are reclaimed. And so this has um, led to you know, all kinds of very uh, familiar programming problems of uh, people returning a pointer to a local variable or a reference to a local variable. And it goes away when the function returns and causes um, all kinds of strange behaviors. So here, what you can always do, of course, from a, um, a function, and if you have a value type, is you can return it by value, and that's what we're doing here. And so down below where we're saying vector x equals u plus v, this seems maybe not so good, right? So we're calling the operator plus, we look up there, it um, is allocating this new vector, returning it by value. And again, in the old days, that would be bad because the um, returning something by value since the original thing goes away when the 
function returns, uh, we have to make a copy to send to the, the caller. And so in this expression, we would call operator plus, which would have this constructor for the temporary. We would return it by value. Um, and then that would invoke a copy constructor. So you would copy that temporary to another temporary and then uh, maybe even call the assignment uh, constructor for uh, vector X. So there's all this kinds of overhead when you know, we're, we're trying to follow the rules of um, you know, declaring variables when we need them and, and so on. But what um, C++11 introduced, and, and this is probably, you know, I was going to point to one feature that, and I know I said I wasn't going to talk about features, but if I was going to point to one, which I'm not, um, that was maybe most important in terms of performance, it would be this. We can overload our constructors. So in, as, as I mentioned back here, we have copy assignment, uh, copy construction, um, when we're, we're using um, these assignment um, operations. C++11 introduced the notion of an R value reference, in, in some sense, meaning a, a reference to a temporary, and then provided two overloads um, for uh, some of the required functions in the class. So it can overload copy construction um, based on an R value reference. So it can overload um, copy constructor. The normal one takes a const reference. Um, but now there's a move constructor which takes an R value reference. And um, you know, the normal copy assignment, again, takes a const reference. We now also have move assignment, which takes an R value reference. And this lets us, again, overload assignment and copy based on whether uh, the parameter being assigned or copied is a temporary. And when it is, what we can do is just move it. So rather than uh, with a temporary uh, returning those that storage, if we have um, these overloads, if we have the move assignment and move constructor, we can just grab those resources and move them, a change uh, ownership. So in this example, again, we're um, re returning uh, this new vector in the operator plus by value. But in this case, we are not calling the copy constructor. The uh, temporary is moved. And in fact, in, in C++11, it was optional. In, in C++17, I think it's, it's mandatory. Um, even the move function can be um, elided. So the, um, the vector that is being declared in the operator plus is, in, in some sense, the vector that's being created in our declaration of, of vector x down below on, on line 10. And similarly, um, when we um, are doing in line 13, um, assigning u to b equal to b plus w, and b plus w is this temporary of vector z, we can just move uh, that to u. Now, there's, uh, here's an example to, to really uh, maybe bring home uh, the value of move semantics. So this is um, swap, a very important uh, utility function in the standard library. So the, the old version of swap uh, is defined this way, and you know, this would work perfectly fine for um, you know, integers or floats or what have you. We create a temporary uh, assign A to that, then assign B to A, and then assign the temporary to B. Those are deep copies. So if we did this with, say, an STD vector, we would be doing the very expensive uh, deep copies. And so the standard library, to get around that, had uh, special overloads on swap to make that shallow. But now with um, move semantics and, and our value references, we can actually move, so we create a, a temporary 
um, in, in new swap, and we can actually move A to this temp, um, which actually then once you move its contents, um, it's basically left uninitialized um, as if it had just been uh, declared. So then we can move, it's ready for move assignment. And so we can move B into A and then uh, move uh, the temporary into B. So this is a, a functionally the same as before, but now we'll do the quote unquote right thing um, for expensive objects um, where we can, uh, again, move uh, the resources in the, in the variables. So this um, introduces some, you know, this whole issue about these double ampersands and when should I declare something as an R value reference. In general, um, when, when you're writing your own code, you don't need to and you shouldn't necessarily use R value references for argument passing, just do uh, the usual things. Out values, so things you're returning from a function should be returned by value. And again, it's safe to do that these days. If you are sending something into a function that you might update, you know, so you're sending value in, it might be updated inside the function, you want the new value back and an out variable, pass it in by reference. Otherwise, uh, pass things in by by const reference. And for advanced use, you can do moves and so forth, but in general, you don't need to do that. Um, so there's an important principle that comes up then with, so we have this notion of ownership of resources and that, um, again, as I mentioned, a vector, the way we defined it is a value type. So in, in some sense, it behaves even though it acquires uh, you know, significant resources compared to a built-in value, it behaves like a built-in type. So if you look on the right-hand side, we have, um, you know, some integers that we declare, and then we do some things with them and, and return from this function. Um, you would never, in your own code, with integers or, or any built-in type, worry about, you know, did I free the memory? Did I acquire the memory? Um, is someone else aliasing this? Um, you just do this, and when the function returns, all of the resources are reclaimed. Well, with um, the left-hand side, even though we're doing vector and it's acquiring, you know, in this case, uh, 1K elements in each one, it also, we can treat it just like a built-in type as a value type. So we can allocate these, um, we can assign them, and the resources will be reclaimed automatically as they go out of scope. So the, um, this very you know, fundamental um, principle in uh, a very modern, <clears throat> a very important principle in uh, modern C++ programming um, known as resource acquisition is initialization. So th this kind of encompasses what we were talking about before that a uh, variable should um, never be declared uninitialized. It should release everything when the destructor is called um, and so forth. And so uh, this way that it's just the scope of uh, a function that uh, determines and, and that takes care of allocating and, and, and returning resources. So it's with the, um, these big six uh, functions, the constructors and assignment and so forth in a class give us complete control over the lifetime of the resources in the object. And so um, <clears throat> the, the scope um, determines when those things get called and, and um, the, by giving the resources an owner, um, we can acquire them, release them in a disciplined way, not have to worry about leaking resources or you know, using um, resources that have been uh, released. So, okay, I'm gonna say something, I'm sure as soon as I say this, the uh, chat's gonna be flooded and the Google Doc's gonna be flooded, but in all of this, um, we never used new or delete and never used um, malloc or free. 
And in fact, I would claim that unless you were implementing things deep inside of a class, you never should use new or delete, and you should definitely never use malloc or free. And in fact, you should almost never, and I, I've found no cases in my own programming the last 10 years, except for one, which I'll come to at the very end, um, where you have to actually use a pointer. So, you know, this is pointers are one of those things that, you know, it's recapitulating ontogeny. You should really think about C as a language without pointers. Now, there are ways to share resources and alias things, and um, uh, that, that's a topic for another time, but in general, well, not in general, you, you never need to use a raw pointer. So um, just briefly, I want to um, go through um, <clears throat> uh, some performance um, results uh, using this vector class. And, and one thing, again, I mentioned that when we had this vector class up before, 13 lines of code, it's very simple. Um, we can do everything, and again, this is kind of thinking about the vector abstraction, we can write everything that we would do with it in uh, a natural way using just the external interface of, of indexing. So for this operator plus, which we uh, briefly saw before, takes two vectors as input uh, by const reference, returns a vector by value, it constructs a vector inside and then adds, adds the elements. Again, all the access to the private data is through the public member functions. Uh, we can do the same thing with uh, scaling the vector. Uh, we construct it inside, return it by value. Uh, we can add um, the, the plus equals, similar to a, a AXP operation, if you like, uh, that just adds one vector to another in place. And so here, uh, we just do this loop and there's no actual construction and we just return a reference to uh, the Y uh, that was passed in. So to time this, and this is really dope, so we created this great abstraction, now we want to measure uh, the performance. So um, I'm going to compare actually uh, five things, so we show um, four of them here, so we're going to compare uh, first of all, just adding x to y without scaling. So this is basically recapitulating an, an AXP operation. So first, use the operator notation to add x to y uh, without uh, scaling it. Uh, write uh, the AXP using the vector notation, the vector external interface, um, as a raw loop. Uh, then for a baseline, or one baseline, we'll do the same raw loop with C, and then uh, in the upper left, um, we're using the operator notation where we scale x and a times x, and then add some of that into y. Um, and we should have, actually have two cases uh, for that. And then finally, um, not shown here, uh, we have a case where we're actually calling um, the MKL XP to, to, to do the timing. And so here are the results. So all of the um, variants there uh, basically have the same performance. So, um, you know, writing y plus equals a times x or y plus equals x or these raw loops are all the same performance as the MKL DAXP except for, I guess, one version of the A times X. And that is uh, due to um, a, the temporary. So when we just have that um, an example, let's say Y plus equals A times X, we have to create the temporary, scale it, and, and then assign that into X. We can actually, there's a second version of this we can do uh, that doesn't actually require that temporary, and that's actually version, the brown version, vector three. Um, and so we can get, again, the same performance. There's no 
abstraction penalty and, and the costs of using vector through its external interface, interfaces is understood and we can um, you know, do things without worrying about um, loss of performance. So um, the way we did the AXP without the temporary, um, I'll do this very quickly, but again, this is as, as fast as the, the built-in one, is um, start, we're starting to border on being clever here. So I'm, I'm putting the warning sign up. So basically what we did was when we had this um, expression a times x, we created a, a temporary type uh, that didn't actually create a temporary vector. And then when we did the assignment into um, y with the plus equals, we actually did the scaling. And again, this starts to um, border on um, being clever. So, you know, your mileage may vary, but I, I think in terms of, you know, just this, because AXP is, is such an important idiom, um, doing it in just some limited cases uh, could be okay. So now I want to briefly um, look at uh, procedural abstraction as um, a, another uh, form of managing complexity. So here is a matrix class, uh, very similar to uh, the vector class we had before, and you should be able to uh, you know, look at this and the, the previous one and, and understand all the design decisions here. Um, one thing that I will... Um, maybe call your attention to is that in the um, upper, I guess what lines five and six, the indexing into uh, the storage, so it's one dimensional storage, we're just using STD vector again, not using a vector of vectors, not using an array of pointers to arrays, just 1D storage. And then we're just doing the, um, you know, 1D to, or 2D to 1D mapping of uh, in, in a row-oriented row fashion uh, within in the um, indexing operation. But with this, um, again, very straightforward class, um, very uh, straightforward interface, we can do some very powerful things. Um, so for instance, here is a, a version of LU factorization. This is essentially like what you would see um, in a textbook. It's implemented only with the matrix accessors. And, um, you know, it's something you could write down, understand, and have confidence in. Um, you know, and again, <laughs> this coincidentally lucky 13 lines of code. And again, what's important here isn't you know, okay, C++ is a better language because we have all these interfaces. It's that, you know, for, for any language, um, this is an important principle that, again, you can kind of manage the complexity of the, the problem. We're not, and we're not mixing levels of, um, you know, storage versus the indexing versus the numerics. We've just, here we have the interface to the matrix and we can focus on the numerics. And in fact, if we want to add partial pivoting, um, there's just two more, lines of code, one to uh, create the uh, uh, pivoting or the permutation vector, one to actually do uh, the pivoting. So very quickly, because I know we want to leave some time for questions, the, the big um, worry, um, justified or not, about uh, matrix classes is how efficient is a matrix matrix product. So here we have a uh, very basic, you know, just as described mathematically, uh, matrix matrix product, again, it's a free function written with the external interface of the matrix class. Uh, and, 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 you know, even as wonderful as, as C++ 11 is, and as wonderful as the compilers are, this won't give the best performance. We have to do this, the same sorts of things. Um, that we have to do in any language to uh, manage locality so we can apply some of our well-known optimizations, again, just using the external interface of the matrix class. So we can hoist and tile, we can block, um, 
And if we do those things, um, so this I actually just re-ran yesterday to make sure I had the right numbers. Um, this is on my 13-inch uh, um, MacBook Pro um, I, Intel i7 2-core. Uh, can get um, up to 16 gigaflops. And there's more, right? So it turns out, so this, and in, 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 when, when I was teaching, this is, a, is another kind of epiphany I had. Normally when I teach this material at this point, it's so okay, now we need to dive down one more level and take advantage of vectorization and advanced vector instructions on different processors. So we would look at um, AVX instructions and how to use those with intrinsics and how to um, create, you know, just the optimal inner loop. But uh, as we were doing this, it turned out that uh, Clang, the, the, the uh, modern LLVM-based C++ compiler, did just fine and, in fact, maybe better at uh, doing vectorization and using fuse multiply adds and, and so forth. And with that, um, actually, again, this is on my um, i7 laptop. Um, with these, you know, you know fairly straightforward uh, locality-based optimizations and Clang automatic vectorization, um, we can get up to, uh, I guess that's, if I remember right, 20 plus, maybe 22 or 23 um, gigaflops. And that, that's sequentially. When, and, and so th this is when maybe I had, had the real epiphany. So um, then the next thing, of course, in, in a course like this is, okay, now we have to parallelize it. When um, adding threads, and this was actually on a, on a different laptop, and we uh, don't have time to really go into detail about how this was accomplished using C++ library, but I got 70 plus uh, gigaflops just with the, the C++ code you saw on the previous slides, plus some uh, threading from the C++ library. And so when this happened, you know, I immediately, and uh, Mike Carew, if you're on the line, you may even remember this email. I um, you know, I sent emails to, to my crew, I sent emails to Bjarne Strustrup, and, you know, everybody I knew who's doing C++ I was like, you know, got 70 gigaflops um, on my laptop, and I was just, I mean, I was just dumbfounded. So, um, the next thing to briefly think about in um, procedural abstraction, of course, is abstraction over types. So, the... Um, Important thing also in having um, a particular well-defined interface to your data types is that you can write algorithms that um, don't depend on a particular type but can be written just to those interfaces. So, of course, this is a well-known technique in um, C++. It, it actually predated C++11 and even C++03, um, well, I think even C++99, now I think about it. So the, the standard template library was this uh, you know, really new way of, of thinking about how to organize um, algorithms and, and data structures uh, to make them uh, freely composable. And so with our LDU factorization, in fact, we can parameterize those on the type of the matrix. And as long as whatever type we're passing in um, has these operator parentheses to indexing the type, we can um, apply this um, algorithm to it. Now there's a cautionary tale um, about uh, parameterization and, and well, <laughs> there's many cautionary tales about parameterization and templates, um, uh, one, one of which is Boost, but that's a, another uh, discussion. Um, but I guess maybe in some sense what's really important to also think about when, if you go to this point in developing your code of, of parameterizing by types. So this is uh, uh, an example. Um, actually, I, I, I 
uh, borrow from a Sean Parent at Adobe. So 1986, John Bentley um, was doing training for programmers at places like Bell Labs and IBM. And he said, I've assigned this problem in courses at Bell Labs and IBM. Professional programmers had a couple of hours to convert the description into a program language of their choice. High-level pseudocode was fine. 90% of the programmers found bugs in their programs, and I wasn't always convinced of the correctness of the code in which no bugs were found. So there's all kinds of reactions one might have to this. One is, um, you know, that that must really be a complicated algorithm. Um, it's not. Actually, what, what he was assigning was binary search. And so another reaction for, um, you know, maybe for, for people of my generation is that our oh, kids these days don't know how to program. But I think the real takeaway is that uh, programming is really, really hard. And getting things right is really hard. And when thinking about, you know, making things reusable, parameterizing by type, making things generic, um, when you get it right, make it generic, uh, but only when you get it right, and so that it can be reused by others in, in the community. So here's an example, for instance, of um, generic accumulate from the standard library. It can take um, uh, you know, any container with an iterator interface um, at what, and um, either add or apply an arbitrary operator between each element um, as, as it moves through and return the result of accumulating to, to the, the whole thing. Um, here is a uh, generic sort, another one that in this case it takes a random access iterator um, and, and sorts the elements between the first and the last. Um, it's customizable with a comparison operation, so you can sort based on different um, features. But there's an interesting thing added to this sort. There's, for two of these versions, there's overloads on execution policies. So I'll whet your appetites with this uh, for HPC that the um, standard library now, or the C++ standard, includes um, parallel versions of the um, standard library algorithms. And the, the parallel versions are accessed by uh, through overloads, where you pass in an execution policy. And that can be sequential, uh, that can be uh, parallel, or it can be unsequenced parallel, which essentially is a uh, for accelerators. And so here's a, a selection of, well not selection, this is all of the uh, parallel standard library algorithms. And if you look at this briefly, um, accumulates actually not there. Um, and in fact, that's not an omission on my part, there is actually no parallel accumulate in, in the standard library. And the reason for that is the accumulate has specific semantics about the ordering of operations for the result, which can't be uh, met and um, par and made parallel. So um, there's a, a new equivalent function um, in the parallel standard library called reduce, uh, which allows out of order um, accumulations. So um, this is what the reduce looks like. Um, you know, it's very much like accumulate, but we can now take this uh, execution policy uh, to overload the um, function and, and make it execute a parallel. Um, example of its usage. Um, so uh, just have four quick calls to accumulate and reduce. Uh, the first one on line three is um, just the regular accumulate. Uh, the next one we're um, calling reduce, but passing in the sequential execution policy. Now we have um, reduce again, but now with the uh, parallel, uh, sequenced parallel execution policy, and then finally the unsequenced parallel execution policy. And the results, when we just time these, the accumulate um, and the reduce, the sequential reduce, were both about um, you know, 1.2 milliseconds, 
and on four cores, the both versions of the parallel execution gave us um, you know, about a, qu a quarter of that time. So uh, to conclude, um, I also want to advocate um, that uh, you know, as you're developing code and trying to you know, be modern and use these idioms and so forth, that you also avail yourself of uh, modern tools to uh, make yourself more productive. So um, Bill Gropp, I, I stole this from him a long time ago, um, has said a, a computer should be a labor saving device, um, like any tool, right? And I think, you know, especially for a computer, it's not gonna help you with manual labor, but it should be especially true for mental labor. So one should use productivity tools. Um, one that I found myself and my students and many people I know uh, to be very um, helpful is uh, the VS Code um, environment from Microsoft. This is actually, this isn't Visual Studio, the IDE for Windows development. This is Visual Studio Code. It's actually a completely separate tool. It's actually based on the Electron uh, JavaScript um, environment. And the great thing about it is it has plugins like IntelliSense, which can tell you where, you know, what are the types of your, that have to be passed into your function um, as you're entering the function, or you know, what are the members that can be called on an object and so forth. So it can save you a lot, huge amounts of time of having to flip back and forth from buffer to buffer to find, um, argument list and, and things like that. So I just highly recommend, you know, the, like with any new tool, there'll be a learning curve, but I highly recommend, um, you know, as, as a way to um, also help you get into um, this new programming language to use a new, new way of programming as well. And of course, and, you know, I, I say this as um, someone who maybe almost literally was born and raised uh, with Emacs. But, um, and what I found is, of course, I'm pro really productive with Emacs because of muscle memory, but that, that's not the same. And you know, I've really found you know, using, well, again, in my case, Visual Studio Code uh, to be immensely time-saving. So um, in conclusion, conclusion, um, I have some links here. Um, the a lot of the, the course I alluded to, um, I put on the web um, at github.io. Um, so it has all of the uh, lecture notes and homeworks and, and so forth. Um, if you have trouble sleeping at night, um, there's also a podcast. Um, so you can listen to uh, the sound of my voice. The um, C++ core guidelines are also on github.io. It's a work in progress, but um, extremely valuable. And that if you want actual reference text on C++, um, the two I would recommend, and, and maybe in some sense the only two I can recommend are, are by uh, Bjorna, Bjarna Strushup himself, a tour of C++, which is, like I says, a tour, and then um, a, a more detailed book, the um, C++ programming language, which covers everything in detail. So things we didn't get to talk about today, but maybe there will be a, a sequel, of course, threads, lambda, const expert, uh, ranges, so forth, um, shared pointer. And then, of course, there's questions about C++ and some of the things we're used to in HPC, like OpenMP, um, C++ and MPI. And this is where I shake my fist at the MPI forum for deprecating the C++ bindings. Um, it's probably the right thing to do, another story. Um, for GPU programming, um, NVIDIA has a library called Thrust, which provides a, an interface very much like the um, standard library parallelization with execution policies that we looked at, so I highly recommend that. So um, finally, thanks um, to uh, the BSSW program for the support to um, do this course and uh, this lecture, in particular, Mike Carew, Lois Kerfin McGinnis, David Bernholt, Hey Anam, uh, Osni Marquez. Um, thanks to Martin Zlewski, who's been here um, 
answer questions in the Google Doc. Uh, Bjarna, Strustrup, Alex Stefanov, Sean Parent, um, all the students that I've had in, in the course I was teaching, the courses um, I've been teaching here based on this. And of course, thanks um, to everyone in the audience for uh, attending today. So I think with that, um, <laughs> uh, I don't know, Ashley, if we have time for questions, but I'm happy to um, maybe field some. Thank you so <clears throat> Sorry, thank you so much, Andrew. I'm going to.